Good morning, friends. You know, I feel like um, this podcast has become a story time because I'm telling so many stories from my life. But when I was five years old, you know, I was convinced that my mom was the most beautiful woman in the world. I remember sitting in the only bathroom in our house and watching her put on her makeup complete with bright red lipstick. I was mesmerized. She had acne scars from when she was a kid. So when she'd go somewhere, she'd put on foundation and then powder. And she seemed to like transform into a princess right before my eyes. It amazed me. I loved watching it happen. She didn't wear eye makeup, but she loved bright red (laughs) lipstick. Now, if you're watching me on YouTube, I do not have on bright red lipstick. I wouldn't be averse to wearing it, but I don't think it looks good on me. With her dark hair and trim body, though, to me, she looked like a movie star. And so I'm sitting there and I said, Mommy, can I wear some lipstick? And she just laughed and she said, you're too young for for red, but maybe we'll get you some pink that you can play with. Every little girl needs to feel beautiful. She smoothed my hair and then she went back to finishing her makeup. She had just applied her lipstick when dad came down the hall to hurry us along. He was preaching at a small Pentecostal church in another town and it was his first time to go there. So he took one look at my beautiful mom and his face <laughs> like turned white and he's like, you need to take that lipstick off. And he was whispering it really urgently. You can't wear red lipstick to church. The words were meant only for mom, but I heard them clearly. I sat there with my mouth open watching dad run off to find his Sunday shoes and his Bible and all the things he needed. But my mom's face fell as she began to wash off the lipstick. And she was sad, and I was sad for her. It looked like her beauty faded as the beautiful red color disappeared down the drain, and with it, all of her beauty went. Why does Daddy not like lipstick, I said. It it makes you look so beautiful. He thinks being beautiful, too beautiful is sinful. That's what she said. But why? Doesn't God like beautiful things? I asked. And she waited a minute and then she said, go get your shoes on, find your little white Bible. We don't have time to talk about it now. So in the car, I tried to continue the conversation with dad. (laughs) I like to kind of step my foot in things, I think, even at that time. And I said to him, I didn't ask him a question. I just said, when I get to be a big girl, I'm going to wear makeup. And he said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, because it's not what good Christian girls do. And for some reason, that particular answer satisfied me at the time. After all, he was a preacher. He should know. For the next 55 years, I didn't wear makeup. Now, there were a few times as an adult I would go to like makeup parties and buy makeup, but not having learned how to apply it correctly, I felt very inept. Mostly I just used a little powder and lip gloss every once in a while. After all, I was a good Christian girl. And as I got older, I began to understand dad's issue with makeup, shorts, sleeveless shirts, low cut dresses, tight-fitting clothes, and even pants of any kind on women. He felt it indicated a woman of loose morals who wanted to attract men, and that was her only uh, her only desire. But he had other rules which went along with these. He preferred I wear dresses all the time. And when I was at home and playing outside, I could wear slacks or shorts if the weather called for it but I was never to wear those kinds of clothes out in public. Along with the no makeup was no jewelry or anything to call attention to myself. 
He also preferred I wear my hair long and not cut it. He did not want me to go to a movie theater or to a dance. And what he termed mixed bathing was off limits. So if you don't know, that means no swimming with boys present. The other rules included no cursing, no holding hands with boys, no smoking, no drinking, no drugs, things like that. Now, my high school years fell during the era era of tie-dyed t-shirts, bell-bottom jeans, hippies, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Now, fortunately, it also was the rise of the Jesus movement. And as a daughter of a preacher, I didn't rebel to the extent I could have. But there was still a part of me that wanted to slap a question authority bumper sticker on the back of my car. I never did, but I sure wanted to. Dad's rules were founded not necessarily in scripture, although he was a man of the Bible. They came from the headquarters of our denomination, which really felt very out of touch with the times. I still wanted to wear makeup. I still wanted to wear jewelry. I still wanted to go to dances, even though I wouldn't have known the first thing about how to dance. Still, it sounded like fun. But dad's version of being a good Christian girl boiled down to this. Don't do anything which might entice a boy. Stay away from bad boys whose only desire is to have sex. Girls must do this by not wearing anything provocative or anything which would call attention to themselves. Now, mom bought me a book to read about becoming a woman. And she had a talk with me to ask if I had any questions. Now, the book was really confusing, but I wasn't going to ask her any questions. We just didn't have that kind of relationship. Thus, the reason she bought me a book instead of talking to me about it. But from the little she and I um, talked about, I got the feeling that if I became sexually active before marriage, it would be all my fault because I would have enticed some boy. Now, that's probably not what she said, but that's the way I interpreted it. With all the precautions and her indicating that this would be something terrible to happen outside of marriage, I wanted nothing to do with looking sexy, whatever that was. Now, I got the distinct message, what boys might do to me would be all my fault. This was further enforced by an incident that happened when I was six. There was a boy in our neighborhood whom I'll call Adam, and he was a little older than me, but he and my brother, who was three, like to play in the woods together. And one day Adam asked me if I'd like to come play in the fort that he had built. It was in the woods next to his house, which was further, uh, I don't know, two or three houses down from, from ours. And he had, he had never invited me to play in his fort. That was only for the guys. So I was excited to be included. He said he wanted to play doctor. I'm naive, remember, I'm only six, okay, don't bash me for what happened. I was thrilled because I had gotten a doctor's kit for Christmas. And I ran inside and got it and then went with them to the fort. And Adam told my little brother to be the receptionist, that I would be the patient, Adam would be the doctor. And I said, well, okay, if you're the doctor here, you can use my doctor's kit. He said, no, no, I don't think I'll need it. And then he told me to crawl inside the fort and for my little brother to stay by the entrance into all the other patients, unless other patients came. And if they did, he was to tell Adam right away. And, you know, like I said, I was naive. I had no idea about what was going to happen. And he said first he had to examine me in detail. I thought this was where he would use the stethoscope and the tongue depressor out of my little plastic doctor's kit. But no, this is where he began touching me. First by pulling up my shirt and then, you know, pressing in various places. Does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? And each time I'd say no, but I was really uncomfortable with what he was doing. Um, and I, 
I didn't really question it until he pulled my shorts down and then my underpants. And I realized what he was doing was not right, but I didn't know what to do or what to say to make him stop. I believe God was really watching out for me because my little brother came in right as Adam pulled my pants down and said, Daddy is calling us to come home for supper. He took one look at what was happening and added, hurry up, sissy, we don't want to be late. Now, my brother is three, but he understood what was happening wasn't right either. I put myself together and ran home as fast as I could. And during supper, Dad asked where we were because it had taken us a long time to answer. And I said, we were playing in the woods by Adam's house. And Randy said, yeah, Adam built a cool, cool fort in the bushes. And mom said, what were you playing? And it seemed like an eternity of silence. So I'm staring down at my plate. And then my little brother blows out. Adam pulled Sissy's pants down. That felt like all the air was sucked out of our small five room house. Dad looked at mom and that look spoke volumes. I stared at my plate, suddenly not hungry. Dad said, we'll talk about this after supper. When supper was over, mom told me to go to my room until they came to talk to me. It felt like I was in there for a hundred years before they came in. It was dad who spoke first. Mom was the disciplinarian in the family, and I was sure she would spank me later. But what they did was far worse than any kind of spanking. So when my dad came in, my dad and mom came in, my dad said, your mom and I have talked and we have decided that you are not to play at Adam's house or in any of the wooded areas. You may play in our yard, and if there are other kids out there playing ball or tag, that would be okay. But you are to stay away from just being alone with Adam. And I'm like, well, can my little brother play with Adam at his house? Can he play in the woods with Adam? And dad said, well, yeah, he can, but it's off limits to you. And then he left and mom tried to talk to me about places I should never allow boys to touch me. I wasn't listening to what she was saying. I was miffed because it felt like I got punished for something Adam did. Who would punish him? No one. Would dad talk to Adam's dad? Probably not. Would he talk to Adam? I didn't think so. No, nope. Adam got off scot-free and I had to stay away from him. But who was going to tell him to stay away from me? It seemed as though they thought this was all my fault. Was it? I didn't know. I'm just a kid, right? But I was determined not to be put into this kind of situation ever again. As a teen, young adult, and even for years after I got married, I did many things to make sure I didn't attract the wrong kind of man who might take advantage of me. In other words, I followed all the rules. I had to. It's what good Christian girls do. I have to follow the rules to be a good Christian. These included all the rules dad wanted me to follow. There was one rule he never had, though. He never had rules about how much we could eat. Overeating was never seen as going against God's rules or being a bad Christian. As an adult, I did feel remorse for overeating, and I did feel like God wanted me to lose weight. I just couldn't wrap my head around how to do it and still eat the foods I loved. Instead, I just worked harder and tried harder to do more good things for God. I knew what the scripture said. I knew I was not saved by following rules or doing good works, but the concept of grace seemed so unnatural. Grace, of course, is not natural, my friends. It's supernatural. God's grace is undefinable. The crazy thing is we think it can't be possible that God's not sitting up in heaven somewhere keeping score of all we've done right and wrong. But God is not concerned about our scorecard. He's concerned 
about our hearts. If we've truly decided to live for him, we will follow him. It's all he wants from us. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, this is in the Passion Translation, says this. It was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in him. We believed in Jesus, is what it's talking about. Nothing we did could ever earn this salvation, for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast, for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. Those words helped convince me that God doesn't expect anything from me. I don't have to do anything to earn the salvation he freely gave me. Still, following all the rules was a stronghold in me for many years. I couldn't understand why the creator of the entire universe would give the gift of his salvation to me and to other humans without expecting something more from us in return. There is only one answer for that. Why, why did he do that? Because he gave me grace, undeserved favor. Didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just gave it to me. He expects nothing in return, but he desires that we love him completely and follow him without question. If we never do another thing from him, he will still love us. I still have his grace poured over me no matter what I do or don't do. I am covered in his grace because I love him. It's my heart's desire to never again be caught in mental strongholds, which keep me from being free to follow him. I know I don't have to earn my spot in heaven. I know following rules is not what will help me spend eternity with Jesus. When I begin to see the rules I was taught to follow were not necessarily God's rules, it really helped me uncover the truth. My parents were just trying to keep me safe, but I took it as gospel truth and this is how I should act or God wouldn't think I was a good Christian. I might not make it to heaven if I didn't follow all the rules. So I better do everything I can to make sure I'm doing enough to earn my way there. I remember several years ago watching a message by a well-known pastor. He had this measuring stick and it went all the way to the ceiling of a large auditorium. And he likened this to the measure of how good a person was. He put himself, you know, at a certain point way down at the bottom, but it indicated he was better than most people, okay, because he's a pastor, right? So he's a good person. And he said, if this is where I am, and then this is where Billy Graham is, and they put Billy a long way above him, then he asked this, the same question about, about Mother Teresa, and then Mother Teresa is here, and he put her above uh, Billy Graham. He said, if this is where I am, and maybe you are too, and this is where Billy is, this is where Mother Teresa is, where is Jesus? This, Jesus was a human, so he must be on the measuring stick. And of course, Jesus is at the very top of the chart, which is up at the top of the ceiling, which was a very tall auditorium, and he couldn't even reach up there. And then he said, and really, He's far above this, he said, because Jesus is off the chart. No matter how many good works I've done or rules I've followed, I will never be where he is. He's beyond my reach. He's beyond your reach. It would be like trying to touch heaven. I can't do it. I need Jesus because he's the key to get me in. All our righteous deeds are as filthy rags in his sight. Isaiah 64, 6 says this. And it, it goes, because of this, Jesus is our righteousness. God sent Jesus to be our righteousness. Romans 3, 23 through 24 says, we all have sinned and are in need 
of the glory of God, yet through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness, his gift of love and favor now cascades over us. I love that visual picture of his love and favor cascading over us, all because Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from the guilt, punishment, and power of sin. We have no righteousness, my friend. Even our so-called good works are done with us in mind instead of God. What is this going to get me, right? We do them thinking they're they're going to make our heaven resume better, (laughs) but no resume will ever get us into heaven. The stronghold of feeling like I had to follow the rules to earn my place in heaven kept me spinning my wheels and not listening to what God really wanted for me. I can never repay the debt that Jesus paid for me. You can't either. We can only love him and out of love follow wherever he leads us. I have no standing to get into heaven except that I stand on the righteousness and faithfulness of Jesus. Romans 3.26 says, So now, because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us righteous in his eyes. In 2013, when I was finishing Sweet Grace, Wendy Walters, who is my writing mentor, advised Gave me some advice. She said, get your hair done, learn to put on makeup, get your nails done, and buy some new clothes. You need to feel beautiful beautiful, so your inner beauty can shine. I was 60 years old, and I had lost 250 pounds. But what she was asking me to do broke all of my dad's rules. I felt like a duck out of water, but I realized it was time to break free of the constraints I had placed around myself. It was time I learned how to look like a woman. My niece gave me makeup lessons. I found an awesome hairdresser and a great nail salon, and I got some new clothes. I allowed myself to feel pretty for the first time. Finally, I was tapping into how God made me. I'm a strong, beautiful woman. I am not afraid. God's got my back. You know, beyond my desire to follow dad's rules, the fear I felt in stepping out and making myself more presenter presentable is a fear thousands, maybe millions of women feel. Many have more of a reason to um, have this fear than I do. It's a fear of what others might do to them. But it is also a fear of their own sexuality, a beauty so strong it naturally draws men to them. This fear, my friends, is not something to be dismissed. It can become another stronghold, but we need not be afraid of who we are and how God made us. If we're sold out to him and allow his Holy Spirit to lead us each step of the way, he will remind us when we cross the line. He made us sexual beings. It is a gift he gave us. Used appropriately in marriage, sexuality combined with emotional and spiritual connection becomes an intimate bond between husband and wife. Why are we so afraid of this beautiful gift? I really think we are afraid of the misuse of the gift, like a burning desire that starts and we can't quench. Fleshly desires come in all shapes and sizes. Jesus said in six, uh, John 16, 33, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. If Jesus could overcome this temptation, so can we. 
he gave up his divinity for the time that he lived on earth as a human with flesh and blood and desires. He was tempted in all ways like we were, but did not sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that. And many times we see Jesus pulling aside to commune with his heavenly father. He had to get instructions. He knew as a human, his connection to the father was what kept him alive and gave him power to overcome the pull of the world. We have access to the same kind of connection through the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit is the one who will lead, guide, teach, and comfort them. The Holy Spirit lives in us and is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It tells us that in Romans 8, 11. He can help us resist temptation if we will submit our desires and cravings to him. These only control us if we give them control. If we ask him, he will lead and guide us. Walking with him then becomes a marvelous adventure in abundance. By his very nature, God's spirit is a never ending source of strength and power and love and peace and abundance. He is everything we need right now. I am so thankful that God revealed his truth to me. I don't have to follow rules. Jesus invites me to follow him. The stronghold which says I have to follow all the rules to be a good Christian is broken. I can go to a movie. I can wear jeans. I can wear jewelry. I can even wear makeup as long as I follow Jesus then he approves of me and he calls me beautiful no matter what. So my beautiful ones, let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for what you did for all of us. Your death on the cross did away with all the petty laws and rules that we think we have to follow. We need only follow you and you will show us the right way to go. Help us to fall so in love with you that we will want to live our lives totally in obedience to you. In your name we pray. Okay, my friends, I can't emphasize enough how Overcomers Academy is a must for keeping you on track on your healthy living journey. Um, I really would love for you to join us at TeresaShieldsParker.com backslash overcomers. And um, I'll be there. I'll be there in the group. So just uh, go to that link and find out all about it and join us there. Until next week, sweet grace for your journey.